Hello, I'm Laura Sabattini, Principal Researcher in the Human Capital Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Off the Shelf, a book discussion series brought to you by the Conference Board. Today, I'm here with Professor Laura Morgan Roberts and Professor Anthony Mayer to speak about the book Race, Work and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience, which they co-edited with Professor David Thomas. Race, Work, and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience is a collection of essays about race in corporate America today. The book features 23 chapters by top researchers and scholars across a variety of disciplines, including business, leadership, organizational behavior, psychology, sociology, and education. The chapters are organized in five sections each highlighting different methodological approaches to studying race. This unique structure gathers a variety of qualitative and quantitative insights, as well as practical recommendations for individual leaders and organizations. Laura Morgan Roberts and Anthony Mayo edited the book and authored three of the chapters. Laura Morgan Roberts is a professor of practice at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business and a visiting scholar at Harvard Business School's Gender Initiative. She has contributed to many publications, including the books Positive Identities and Organizations and Positive Organizing in a Global Society. Anthony Mayo is the Thomas S. Murphy Senior Lecturer on Business Administration in the Organizational Behavior Unit of Harvard Business School. Is co-author of books of the books in their time and paths to power published by Harvard Business uh, Review Press. Both guests have authored numerous other books, articles, cases, which I'm not going to list just for the interest of time today, but that you can uh, view on their faculty pages. Uh, Laura and Anthony, welcome to Off the Shelf. Thank you for having us. Yes, thanks for having us. I would like to start our discussion with uh, some general questions about division for and the structure of the book. Um, I think it's important to understand the story behind the volume and also the amount of work that goes into editing a collection of essays such as this one. Uh, what was your inspiration to put together this book? So the inspiration for this book actually emanated from the 50th anniversary celebration of the African American Student Union at Harvard Business School. So in 2018, that marked the 50th anniversary of the formation of the African American Student Union. And we use that as a milestone occasion to say, what do we actually know about race? Um, what are things, uh, how are things changed in the last 50 years? How are things the same? Uh, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And so as part of a broader spectrum of activities to celebrate this 50th anniversary uh, in 2018. We brought together scholars, uh, academics, practitioners uh, together who are studying race, looking at race issues and organizations and said, what is the latest thinking on and the latest research on race, work, and leadership? And that uh, was part of a conference that we had, and that led to a call for papers and ultimately the publication of this book to commemorate not only the 50th anniversary of the formation of the African American Student Union at Harvard Business School, but uh, the formation of a lot of things that happened in 1968. Mm -hmm. That was a very fervent time in the country, and uh, not only at Harvard Business School, but at other schools, it was a period of activism, and so we want to celebrate that. I was very excited to have the opportunity to return to Harvard Business School, where I had previously served on the faculty. Um, to specifically work with the research for this book and for the other ASU 50 projects. I have to say for me, it was like a dream come true. Uh, doing this research, a focused study of race, work, and leadership um, that centered the black experience was something that I had aspired to do when I began my graduate studies over 20 years ago. I grew up in Gary, Indiana, and at the time, in which I grew up, uh, we had a majority African American population. So I was surrounded by models of black leadership and got to know intimately what those journeys entailed. And I wanted for the academy to reflect those experiences and voices on leadership as well. 
And you partly already answered this question, but I wanted to go back to one question that you pose at the very beginning of the book about why do we need a book on race, work, uh, and leadership, and one that focuses on the Black experience. Why is this book especially important at the present time? At the present time, this book is especially important because it sort of takes up the myth that had been growing and spreading, particularly in American society, about a post-racial world. There was an assumption that with the ascendance of Barack Obama, with a peak number of African-American CEOs of Fortune 500 companies in 2002, that we had conquered the greatest challenges related to race in our society. And perhaps we could move on to thinking about diversity and inclusion more broadly. What we found through our research is that myth is just that. Unfortunately, it is a myth. And as is reflected in many recent events in our global society, race is still a divisive issue that explains a number of professional and societal challenges that we're facing. This book is particularly important because it takes up that conversation in a way that helps leaders understand how they can develop new paths forward that help us to move beyond some of the longstanding challenges, obstacles, misunderstandings, and really start to learn from and embrace the diversity in our world. Yes, and, and I really enjoyed uh, reading the chapters that provided both data and anecdotes and stories, but also specific recommendations. So I definitely want to get to that part of the discussion. Uh, before we um, dwell into the insights of the book, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the considerations that you made to organize the research that you present in the volume. Why was it important to highlight different methodological approaches to studying the, the intersection of race, leadership, and work? I think for us, we wanted to take a broad spectrum approach to understanding the issues of race, work, and leadership. And so we wanted both the big data set uh, analysis. And so there are a couple of chapters that actually have some of the largest data sets that have ever been built about black professionals. And so we can sort of understand some big sweeping data analytics uh, information. But we also uh, wanted to have other approaches to this conversation on race. And that's why our authors come from a broad spectrum of, of different uh, disciplines. And so we have comparative studies that look at the experience experiences of black professionals versus other races. Uh, we have the lived experience chapters that actually looked at some of the individual challenges that uh, black professionals have had in their career. Uh, for instance, one of the chapters in the book talks about uh, black instructional coaches, and they talk about the experiences that these coaches have had going into predominantly white schools. And the chapter actually opens with this anecdote of this uh, black coach coming in to set up her talk to get ready to do the instructional work that she's going to do. And one of the teachers that she's going to be leading in this instruction comes in and says, oh, are you setting up the presentation? Not assuming that this is actually the presenter. And she said, no, I, I'm actually the presenter. Uh, I'm here setting it up for myself. And she, uh, the teacher that was going to be in that room, took a step back and said, oh, am I in the right room? And so this notion of, uh, of these sort of microaggressions that happen at this individual levels, the story of race is the story of the individual. It's also the story of the collective. And we wanted to tell both stories in the book. Great. Um and we are now going to take a short break for some quick announcement and be back in just a minute to continue our conversation with Laura Morgan Roberts and Anthony Mayo. Looking for additional insights beyond this podcast? The Conference Board hosts an array of annual seminars and conferences on a wide selection of topics, ranging from engagement to strategic HR, talent management, leadership, and diversity and inclusion. Learn best practices from top companies and hear insights from renowned practitioners and thought leaders, all while having the opportunity to network and collaborate with your peers. For a complete list of our upcoming programs, you can visit us at www.conferenceboard.org events. And as an added thank you for listening to this program, use code POD300 to save $300 off your registration. That's P-O-D 300. Seats fill up quickly, so visit our website and reserve your spot today. Hello, 
and welcome back to our discussion about the book Race, Work and Leadership, New Perspectives on the Black Experience with Laura Morgan Roberts and Anthony Mayo. Anthony and Laura, uh, we just spoke about how and why the book came together. Um, wanted to talk about uh, more about the insights from the book. The chapters, as I mentioned before, have a lot of rich research and data and findings, as well as stories and success stories. What surprised you about the findings of the book as you were putting this together? There were several surprises, one of which had to do with the consistency in experiences across this wide range of contexts that were included in the book and using these different methodological approaches. We were still coming away with very similar storylines across those contexts. For instance, we found that black professionals in a wide range of sectors experienced authenticity tensions that these authenticity tensions were part of the impetus for founding a su 50 in 1968 and they're still part of the millennial experience in the workforce today where black professionals and other professionals from diverse groups are coming to work and trying to find pathways and opportunities where they can integrate the different aspects of their identities in the work they do and feel included and feel like they belong and have a place. So we didn't expect to find that level of convergence across contexts. When you're looking at physicians, you're listening to lawyers, you're listening to instructional coaches, you're listening to professors. You're listening to CEOs and managing directors in financial firms, and they're all having this same experience around authenticity. A second common experience had to do with authority and the lack of affirmation or recognition that these black professionals often received once they were in leadership roles. They had the credentials, Many of them also had the pedigree. We have two studies based on uh, two of the largest databases ever created of black alumni and career pathways, Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School. Incredibly talented individuals who have invested a tremendous amount in higher education. And yet, when they step forward to lead, they're still having to work that much harder to establish their own authority and a followership in the groups in which they're leading. Yes, and, and I have to say, you know, it's so interesting because the consistency is not only across disciplines. As I mentioned before, the book provides uh, writings and research from scholars from a lot of different disciplines, but also it features different sectors of work. So that consistency can really provide insights that think uh, as a diversity and inclusion practitioner, I think that people can use in very useful way. Um, so based on, on, on what you saw, what are some of the greatest challenges that are facing black leaders today? Well, I think that Laura cited some of them. So one of the key challenges is this authenticity tension. Can you actually bring your full self to work? And so you see a lot of uh, black professionals trying to navigate how how full of my how, how can I bring my full self to work and how do I navigate these different conversations that I'm having and there's a, a chapter that talks about the facades of conformity and so what that chapter speaks to is the fact that black professionals end up taking on these facades where they have to they believe they have to be a certain way or act a certain way or or, or be a certain person uh, for instance one of the uh, black women that I spoke to um, she said to me, uh, as she was talking about how she was navigating her career, she talked about, you know, for 10 or 15 years, I tried to be the best white person that I could be, the best white male that I could be. And then I realized, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm never going to be as good as a white male. Uh, and my trying to be that version that I cannot be is not bringing my full self to work. And so it took, but it took her a long time to realize I can actually uh, bring uh, my full self and it can be appreciated. Although, as we've talked about and we've seen in some of the challenges, it's not always appreciated. And so you're, you're almost having to do this, uh, this calculation in your head uh, instead of actually doing the work, thinking about, oh, can I be myself? Can I be authentic? Can I put myself forward? Where people in the majority aren't necessarily having those types of conversations. Yeah, and 
so I think part of what she was saying in that was, I'll never be as good at being a white male as a white male is. However, I can be extraordinary at being a black older female from Kentucky or wherever she was from, but all of the different threads or intersections that made her identity unique and special were the resources that she was able to draw upon as a source of strength. And so we highlight these challenges in our book and we see them consistently, but we also see navigating we see black professionals who are capably navigating mm -hmm. these challenges and using this ingenuity and this fortitude and resourcefulness to find pathways that work for them, um, even in a contested terrain of leadership advancement, you might say. Definitely. And are there particular uh, factors or particular um, characteristics, uh, I would say, of uh, the black leaders who beat the odds, so to speak, mm -hmm. and are able to get through and, and, and these barriers uh, that we could uh, summarize here. I know that it's a lot more complex than that, but I'd be curious to hear some highlights about that. It is complex. Um, there's certainly stories of resilience. Uh, which are very prominent in the book. There are stories of um, healthy psychological development, how an individual, even in a racist context, can sustain a robust sense of self. Our two of our contributors, Shockley and Holloway, talk about that formation and maintenance of a robust sense of self, regardless of the messages that society may be giving you about whether or not you can effectively advance to leadership or hold or exercise leadership authority within uh, your particular space. But we also found, importantly, that none of them get there alone. They don't beat the odds alone. Yeah, and so what we see is the difference between champions and mentors. So a lot of organizations talk about the role of mentors and how and some have formalized mentor programs. And the people that beat the odd that we spoke to said, yes, it's great to have a mentor that you can go to for advice, but what we really need are sponsors and champions, people who are going to have some skin in the game, who are going to have my back, who are going to actually put themselves forward. Yes, it's great to have a sounding board and it's great to get advice about how you ascend your career, but it's more important to be given those opportunities, to be given those chances, those stretch assignments. And if you have those people in your corner, uh, then you're more likely to advance in, in, uh, in the organization. Definitely. And I think this actually is connects very well to my next question, which is about organizations. And um, again, as a diversity and inclusion uh, researcher, I find it very interesting that there's a lot of insights in your book that can be helpful for organizations to improve their diversity and inclusion efforts. Uh, what do your findings tell us about uh, diversity and inclusion programs in organizations? One thing that we learned across contexts is that diversity and inclusion programs, while they have become more popular and disseminated more broadly, they are also inadvertently or perhaps purposefully, I don't know, um, but serving the function of erasing race or minimizing race, um, because I like to consider race as the hottest place in the fire when it comes to diversity and inclusion conversations. And so there are certain types of diversity and inclusion conversations that feel a little safer and a little more comfortable and help us to all engage on a level playing field, so to speak, where we can talk about our differences as present and relevant in the here and now without having to address structural inequalities or historic disadvantage that has or that explains the different experiences that people may have before they even enter the doors of our organization. It, conversations about race, as is evident in this book, they have to be anchored in the past, present, and future. They can't just focus here and now, short-term business case for bringing innovative, diverse ideas and perspectives. We really have to deal with some of the more challenging and intractable dynamics that explain the persistence of racial inequalities over time. 
So the first thing that we learn about these diversity and inclusion programs is that they tend to shy away from race. But if we're going to address many of the issues of inclusion, equity, and greater diversity, we have to deal with race and other dimensions of difference through a broader lens. And to be able to do that, organizations have to create a psychologically safe space. So the other thing we learned is that organizations that are creating these safe spaces to have these conversations and actually training individuals to have these conversations, because this doesn't always come natural. You're going to stumble, you're going to fall, and that could be the end of it. And so making sure that it is a psychologically safe environment and that both blacks and non-blacks are comfortable talking about race. And also creating the uh, the other element is really creating this culture of inquiry Mm -hmm. uh, in organizations and a climate of inquiry and questioning. Uh, All those things help to improve uh, the experience for all. Yes, and um, I find it helpful, again, that the recommendations can be very practical. Uh, One of the findings that stood out to me is about the intersection between inclusion and engagement and how uh, oftentimes those lived experiences can vary based on on your background. So you can be engaged, but not necessarily feel included. And so I think that the research you present can really provide insights. But as you said, there has to be the willingness to look at the complexity on intersectionality and and look more in, in more depth on all these issues. It's true. Engagement Um, often focuses on my connection with the task itself or my absorption with the task itself. Um, And oftentimes, uh, marginalized individuals will invest even more heavily in the task as a way to try to cope with or buffer some of their experiences of exclusion organizationally. So it's important for organizations to collect data on all of these dimensions and assess the differences in people's experiences of engagement, of inclusion, of uh, managerial support and other indicators like Gallup Connect, like Gallup Collects as as highlighted in the chapter by our Gallup researchers. Um, But also at the point of exit interviews to collect data that helps people to understand why black workers leave. We have a fascinating piece in the book about why black leaders leave and how that adversely impacts the organizations when they leave. And so another recommendation around data and inquiry would involve asking those questions even when things don't seem to have worked out or the organization and the employee are parting ways for a range of reasons. There's always an opportunity to learn more. And I think what we also know about engagement is that a lot of it comes down to the task that Laura talked about, but also it comes down to relationship with your individual manager and supervisor. So the things that we talk about, yes, they're good from an organizational perspective, the culture that you want to have, the environment you want to have. But when we talk about engagement is how engaged are you with your direct supervisor, with your manager? How comfortable are they talking about uh, issues of race or issues of inclusion? Are they giving you feedback? Are they coaching you? Uh, So what we also see in the book is that sometimes black professionals are not getting the same level of coaching, the same level of feedback, the same level of advice, maybe because uh, somebody doesn't want to inadvertently come across as potentially racist because I'm saying something negative, and so they withhold. But that withholding actually Mm -hmm. withholds the opportunity for for those individuals to advance. And so I think there's some things on the micro level at the supervisor level uh, that organizations can do in terms of training and openness. And then there are things at the organizational level that we've talked about. Definitely. And as you're talking, I'm thinking about how these findings are parallel with research about gender and looking at how women are not given often the specific uh, feedback. So that highlights, again, intersectionality and, 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 and how these barriers can compound <laughs> as well. Um, I wanted to, you've already uh, moved to the, uh, in your uh, you know response, uh, speaking more about recommendations, and I wanted to uh, look a little bit more into uh, the area of the book uh, that uh, provides recommendations for both individuals and organizations organizations. Uh, What do you think we can tell to people who think that um, it's time to move beyond race? And uh, how can we make the case that it's really important for everyone to read the book and be engaged and understand these important issues? 
Well, one way to advance the conversation uh, when that question is raised is by pausing and looking backward. Uh, just acknowledging and recognizing that race has been part of the fabric of the global economy for centuries. And just like any tapestry, you can't, after it's been woven, come in and start to pull out the threads individually that you don't like or that are triggering or that are painful and, and make you uncomfortable. If you do that, then you start to unravel the entire tapestry itself. So race has already been embedded in the global economy. Race has been embedded in the way that our organizations are designed and, and structured, and it has shaped and continues to shape the experiences that workers of all backgrounds have, not just black workers. Um, so past to present, there is a legacy around race that still affects our organizational experiences today. Um, the question then becomes, how do we move forward to the future? Is it best at this point to stop talking about race? Are we finished with this conversation? Have we beat it into the ground? I might offer, we consider changing the way that we talk about race. So much of our quote unquote race talk is about race as a problem that needs to be solved. And oftentimes as uh, McClooney and Rebello in our book point out, diversity and initiative programs are not as much about managing diversity, but perhaps about managing blackness, about trying to find ways to promote more assimilation because the assumption is that the racial diversity is problematic for the organization. How would things change if we started to view and understand this wide range of experiences as an asset, not for organizations to exploit, but for organizations to invest in, to nurture, perhaps even treasure, so that they can be more innovative, uh, more globally responsive, um, and have more sustainable business models going forward. Uh, it'll be very difficult for us to do that without addressing um, the, the current dynamics that race and other dimensions of difference introduce, even those that make us a bit less comfortable. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a great um, response to this question. Um, as we wrap up, I wanted to uh, pose a question about your experience and your personal insights, learning from doing this work and also as a team. Uh, it reminds me there's one chapter in your book about phenomenological approaches and, and there's two authors. I think the chapter is the one called uh, A Million Gray Areas, <laughs> where the, the two authors speak about their own intersectionality and how it plays in their work and collaboration. What was your experience working together on this project? It was a phenomenally uh, great collaborative experience. So working with Laura has been a true delight for me. I came to this uh, a little hesitant about what could I say as sort of middle-aged white guy on this uh, topic. In fact, most people who uh, don't know me or haven't Googled me will say, oh, Tony Mayo is a, a black guy. Uh, and they, they automatically assume that anybody who's going to be writing on these issues is black. And so I've, I've often had to, in fact, I, I had at a research conference not long ago, a young white uh, researcher from another school came to me and said, what is it like being a white person talking about race? Uh, and what tips do you have uh, for me? I didn't have a whole lot of tips, but, uh, except that if this is something that's important to you, uh, then it's worth doing. And it's important to me uh, to be part of the conversation. If we're going to actually move the needle forward on uh, discussions of race and changing the narrative, as Laura talked about, it has to be a broader conversation. It can't just be amongst uh, a certain group of individuals. It has to be a broader in group of individuals. Uh, in fact, many of the individuals that we talked about when we talk about champions and mentors, a lot of those mentors and champions were white men, older white men. If you look at the organizational dynamics, the demographics of organizations, that's who are in positions of power. You have an opportunity then in that position of power to do something, uh, to change the narrative, to give opportunities, to focus on someone's potential. Uh, so it's been a tremendous experience to be an ally uh, in this particular process. And um, I've tremendously benefited from working and learning from Laura and David. 
Thank you, Tony. (laughs) I've benefited as well tremendously. I started my faculty career at Harvard Business School. I'm a career academic, so I was 27 years old when I entered the classroom teaching 90 Harvard Business School MBAs in a first-year required course on leadership. I was not what they expected. (laughs) And at that time, Um, Even though I had this intellectual interest and desire, and I had been studying race for several years, I did not know how to introduce this awareness around diversity and inclusion into that space. How to invite people into conversations about race in ways that would be productive. So many young scholars are advised, even today, I just met with dozens last week at the Academy of Management meetings, advised even now, don't write about that. Don't maybe not study diversity at all, but definitely don't study race. If you're an African-American, people are going to assume that that's all you know or that you have an agenda or that you can't be objective and all of these other ways to try to question and undermine your scholarship as well as your own career commitment. Uh, So it's especially significant for me to be able to engage in this project and to do it in collaboration with Tony um, working at HBS together on this was really a full circle moment for me. And I also learned so much about how to have these conversations in ways that are safe and that helped us both learn a tremendous amount. We have far more data that we could even pack into this book. And so as Ann Fudge, one of our um, Harvard Business School alumni and um, generous endorsers of the book says, let the much needed conversations begin. Yes, and this is a great conversation. So as the last uh, question for this podcast, we always like to ask for uh, suggestions for future reading. Uh, or further reading, I should say. Uh, In addition to your book, what other resources would you recommend to leaders who want to address racial bias and disparities in organizations? The first thing I would like to do is to give a huge shout out to all of the contributors of our book. They're amazing thought leaders in this field and they've all published very widely. They also um, were quite intentional in providing a list of references in each of their chapters that could continue to advance the conversation. So that would be my first recommendation is check out the work of the contributors in this book. They are amazing thought leaders. And oftentimes, because of many of the dynamics that we talked about before and the siloed nature of the academy and the boundaries between quote unquote Ivy Tower, world of practice, so on and so forth. We just don't hear enough and learn enough about the work that's already being done. Um, One of the pieces that I'm most excited about recently, in addition to the work of the contributors, is the New York Times uh, 1619 feature that presents a comprehensive group of essays that documents the impact of enslavement on American societal formation and culture uh, based on the commemoration of a 400 year history of enslavement of Africans here on the U.S. soil. Great. And Anthony and Laura, thank you so much for speaking with us today. And thanks to our listeners for tuning into this conversation. If you'd like to purchase the book, Race, Work, and Leadership, you can find it at Harvard Business Review Press and on online bookstores. For more information, you can also visit the website, raceworkleadership.com, all in one word. Uh, Again, it's raceworkleadership.com. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our off-the-shelf book discussion podcast, or you can explore the entire catalog of podcast programming from the Conference Board visited by visiting our website at www.conferenceboard.org slash podcast. This is Laura Sabatini from the Conference Board. Thank you for joining us today.